Good evening, everyone. Buenas noches a todos. Uh, before we start, please locate at the bottom of your screen a world icon where you can um, select your language preference. So, antes de comenzar, ubíquese hacia abajo de la pantalla para seleccionar su preferencia de idioma um, haciendo el clic abajo en el icono que, um, mundial que se mira como un globo. The presentation is scheduled for one hour, which will be followed by a Q&A. You can submit your question um, via the Q&A button, the option below at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A. Um, you can also check out any questions that may have already been answered by clicking the Q&A button. So our mission at Sonoma Land Trust is to protect the natural lands of Sonoma County for everyone's benefit. Founded in 1976, Sonoma Land Trust has protected over 50,000 acres to date. I'm Mireya, co-hosting today, and with us are our presenters, Joe Clogger, Griselda Correa, and also Nicole Warwick. So Plogger is one of our stewardship program man project managers here at the Land Trust, a West Sonoma County native who grew up among the Redwoods. Joe stewards our Sonoma Valley Preserve and serves as coordinator for the Sonoma Valley Wildland um, Collaborative. Joe has a bachelor's in political science from Pacific University is working towards a natural resource management certificate and is an active volunteer in support of ecologically beneficial prescribed fire with the Good Fire Alliance. Prior to joining the Land Trust, he worked in political campaigns and public policy, most recently as a field representative for Representative Mike Thompson. Joe so has through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail worked as a whitewater rafting guide, is an avid cyclist, and is happiest sleeping under the stars. Thank you for joining us tonight, Joe. And I have the pleasure of also introducing Grisela Correa Martinez, who is a first-generation immigrant born in Michoacan, Mexico, and raised in Sonoma County. Grisela graduated from Elsie Allen High School received three associate degrees from the SRJC before deciding to transfer to Sonoma State to obtain her bachelor's in liberal studies from the School of Hutchins with a minor of, in women's health. Vizela has many interests, some of which have been shaped by life experiences and others that are driven by her community advocacy. Grisela began her work with Santa Rosa Community Health as a peer educator in 2009, doing reproductive health education and advocating for reproductive justice. She later became a sexual health educator, a program coordinator for the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative, and is now the communications and community engagement manager. Through her work, with the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative. She has coordinated events and training for facilitators and continues to explore opportunities to embed and sustain mind-body techniques in our community. Grisela is also a trained facilitator through the Center of Mind-Body Medicine. She has facilitated numerous groups, workshops, and was inspired to adapt techniques and create a calm, meeting model. Grisela is currently finishing her second year with uh, Leadership Santa Rosa as part of Class 36, and she is interested in continuing to learn about the intersectionality between sectors and specifically exploring the impacts of trauma, barriers to providing healing spaces in the workplace, and together looking for solutions to become a more resilient community. 
Thank you for joining us tonight, Griselda. And we also have Nicole Warwick, who is a mother, a breast cancer survivor, an educational psychologist, and environmental health advocate. She is a programs manager for Daily Acts, leader, uh, Daily Acts Leadership Institute, where she co-facilitates the Leadership Institute, manages eco to school programs, and is co-founder of several successful coalitions and organizations, including Sonoma Safe Agricultural Safe Schools, Families Advocating for Chemical and Toxic Safety, and the North Bay Environmental Health Network. She also serves on the Sonoma County Resilience Collaborative Steering Committee and Conservation Action Fund for Education Board of Directors. A lifelong learner, Nicole brings an interdisciplinary approach to her work. She has a master's degree in psychology and is certified in person-centered expressive art therapy for healing and social change and mind-body medicine for trauma reduction and resilience. She is bilingual in Spanish and has extensive training in trauma-informed education and nonviolent communication. Tonight's presentation is being interpreted live thanks to Mariana Rivarola. The, la presentación de esta noche también está ofrecida en español. Gracias a Mariana Rivarola. Por favor, de seleccionar su idioma de, prefer, de preferencia abajo, haciendo el clic en el icono mundial. And now I'll turn it over to Joe. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me get my presentation going. So thank you for that introduction, Maria. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Joe Plogger. I'm on the stewardship team here at Sonoma Land Trust. Um, and I'll, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the Sonoma Valley Wildlands Collaborative and what we're doing to respond to some of the recent wildfires. Before I dive in, I wanted to give a little bit of context of some fire history in this region. Uh, Frank Marriott was a sailor and explorer, and this quote comes from a journal entry as he explored Sonoma County in December of 1850. So as you can see, um, fire has been present long before um, any of our, uh, many of our ancestors were here, going back a long time. For thousands of years, our ecosystem here in Sonoma County evolved in relation with fire. The trees, shrubs, and grasses that we love and enjoy require fire to reduce competition, control invasives, and regenerate. Removing this fire has allowed certain species to grow out of balance with significant consequences when wildfires burn through. What was historically low severity and high, high frequency, as much as every couple of years, has become high severity and low frequency and we wanna take back that control and manage fire on our own terms. It took 150 years to get to where we are now today, so it won't happen overnight, but we're working hard to create healthy and resilient landscapes for our plants, wildlife, and neighbors throughout the region. So what is the Sonoma Valley Wildlands Collaborative? You can see all of our logos there. Uh, following the 2017 fires, Sonoma Land Trust and our five partners uh, groups realized that to properly respond to catastrophic wildfire, we would need to think bigger and get, go bigger and broader than we had before. We all protect and land, manage lands in Sonoma Valley and we form this partnership to implement strategic fuel reduction and vegetation management projects with the intention of helping reduce future wildfires, protect communities and improve ecosystem health. So collectively, uh, the Wildlands Collaborative Partners own and manage about 18,000 acres in the Sonoma Valley that you can see here. Um, these properties on both sides of Highway 12 in areas designated by CAL FIRE as high and very high fire hazard severity. And the lands surround many communities, including Oakmont, Kenwood, Glen Ellen, and are just north of uh, the, the communities of the Springs and the city of Sonoma. So this map's a little complicated, but basically each color shows the footprint of a different wildfire over um, the you know, past uh, 70 years or so. So it's indicated by the dark orange hatching, um, where lands make up a significant portion of what was uh, impacted by the Nuns fire and the north part of the region was also uh, impacted again last year with the glass fire. So this map shows that wildfire has happened 
uh, over time and it will happen again. And it doesn't respect jurisdictional boundaries or property lines. But it also means that we have the opportunity to take action to manage our land, to reduce the intensity of future wildfire events and provide a buffer for the neighboring residential communities. So what are we actually doing? We're now about two years into our initial 10-year plan, which includes three main areas of focus. So the first is uh, vegetation management and fuel reduction projects. So we've been funded by two CAL FIRE fire prevention grants, just received the second round about a month ago. And so that's a total of about $3 million that we're using to hire crews to go in, remove overgrown brush and small trees and restore the conditions to closer to what it looked like historically. We've treated about 300 acres so far and have about 1,000 acres identified as our initial round of priorities. These are often along roads, ridges, um, and or bordering neighborhoods. And second, after that vegetation work, I uh, plan to follow up by reintroducing fire under controlled conditions uh, following a uh, careful prescription. You can see an example of that at the Boobery Preserve here on this slide. Uh, so working with Cal Fire and other local fire departments, we have burned about 200 acres at Boobery, Sonoma Valley Regional Park, Mitsui Ranch, and Jack London State Park, and want to work to scale that number up significantly. And then the third part is our ongoing landscape scale efforts. So we're, all of the partners have committed to work together to find ways to coordinate strategic projects, uh, you know, whether it's vegetation management, burning, or any, anything else we haven't thought about, or thought of yet, um, to work across our shared boundaries and at a scale that will have significant impacts um, from you know, basically Sonoma Mountain to Hood Mountain and everywhere in between. That's where we want to eventually um, cover that whole area. So here's my contact information and the website for the collaborative, which includes some more detailed information on our projects and some news articles and things like that. So I'll be sticking around, uh, to have her, sticking around and happy to answer any questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom. We have some time at the end for that as well. Thank you. for that introduction to the Sonoma Valley Wildlands Collaborative. And now I'll turn it over to Griselda. Good evening, everyone. My name is Griselda Correa. And I want to say thank you to Medea for the beautiful um, bi uh, biography. Um, so as she mentioned, I'm the Communications and Community Engagement Manager for Santa Rosa Community Health. Um, at Santa Rosa Community Health, in addition to providing primary care to over 40,000 patients across Santa Rosa, we are also spearheading the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative. Many of you may have heard about the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative and the wonderful work that has been done to embed and sustain mind-body techniques throughout Sonoma County. But if you haven't heard, I'd like to share a little bit of our vision that we have for our community. The Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative aims to prevent the progression of stress and trauma effects into more serious behavioral, physical, and social impacts. We are planning on doing this through training over 200 facilitators in mind-body techniques through the Sonoma um, trained by the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. We also uh, have asked that our trained facilitators come from all different sectors, including teaching, some of who are also counselors, some who work in the health sector, but also those that work in business. Over the past two years, since the Resilience Collaborative launched in 2018, we have delivered or over 80 eight-week skills groups and over 100 mind-body workshops in our community. Due to the pandemic, we have had to shift quite a bit of how we are delivering. Our skills groups and workshops were being done in person and now they are being done virtually. We have a uh, resilience platform we call socoresilience.org, which you are more than welcome to join to meet some of our trained facilitators, as well as have access to recordings in both English and Spanish. I do wanna give a shout out. I do see that in our audience, we do have quite a bit of our trained facilitators. 
And I am happy to also say that I am um, co-facilitating this or going to be able to present um, one of our trained facilitators, Nicole Warwick, in just a second. But before we do that, I want to talk about these past five plus years since we've been in disaster after disaster. I'd like to acknowledge that when we hear the word resilience, it usually means the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or tough situations. A question that I have for our audience is, when we have experienced a natural disaster, what are the first things that we think about in grabbing as we're exiting the door? So if you all could drop it into the chat function. What are some of the things that you think about? What are the first things that you grab when we are under emergency or urgency? Any family photos, our pets, important paperwork, paintings, the things that hold sentimental value to some of us, important document and baby blankets, a go bag, computers, artwork, documents, clothes. Thank you. I'm wondering how many of us have a emergency plan in addition to these items? Who are we going to call? Where are we going to go? What are the shelters that have popped up in the past that are closest to us? What is our emergency plan? It makes me think about when we were in elementary and middle school, how there was an earthquake plan, a fire plan. Do we have one? Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. And these are things that I wonder, right? Because Many of us are in, in, when we're in urgency mode, we forget what is our emergency plan? Do I have it written down somewhere? Where is my go back? And what are the things that I need to grab first? As we move into our next slide and talk about resiliency and the core of today's presentation, I wanna remind us that resilience, and when we say the word resilience, it usually means the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or tough situations. This could be rebuilding, a structure, but it's also important to think about the long-term recovery of our own well-being. Today, along Nicole, we will be exploring the CALM meeting model. CALM is an acronym that we use to express connection to the breath, acknowledging our efforts or acknowledging those in the room, leveraging a technique or the group wisdom, and identifying mindful next steps as we move through our world. At times, when we're in urgent response, we forget to breathe. We forget to leverage our techniques. We forget to acknowledge, wow, that was hard and I'm okay. And sometimes we don't think about what is our next step that I can take that will give me from point A to point B. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nicole and she will be walking us through a few of our techniques as well as sharing more with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Griselda. Thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. And thank you to Sonoma Land Trust for hosting this space for us. Um, and thank you to Mireya for the lovely introduction. Um, my name is Nicole Warwick. I am a programs manager for the Leadership Institute at Daily Acts. And I also have the great privilege of being on the steering committee for the Sonoma Community Resilience Collaborative and have 
I've been in um, learning community with Griselda, which has been tremendously supportive for me. Um, I know that we're all gathered here and many of us have had various layers of impact over the last several years being affected by the fires um, and extreme weather, including floods in West County. And even on my way here this evening, I received a notification from watch duty of a small fire that had started up near where I live out in West County. And so this is very present for me, for us as a community that we are living amongst a fire ecology. And what does that do for us? These, what does that mean for us? How does it land in our bodies? And how do we, how do we lean into that resilience? Um, as Griselda had illustrated, we like to use this calm meeting model. So I'm going to orient things through this lens today where we'll first calm and connect to breath, acknowledge all the efforts of all of us here. We are all have this one thing in common. We love this land we live on. We are stewards and we care for it deeply. And as such, um, it's important for us to acknowledge our efforts, our relationships, the things we're doing, and then to leverage the resources and the collective wisdom amongst us. And I will be teaching a couple techniques, including a guided visualization uh, where we're invoking our own inner guide and wisdom sources. And then we'll come back as a whole group and share and reflect what are the next steps that we can do. So before we transition to that though, I'm really curious for, for us as a community you know, landing in this content with Joe, the acknowledgement of our fire ecology, Griselda graciously reminding us of what we've navigated over the last several years. How are you right now? And if you wouldn't mind sharing that in the chat with us, just right now, as you're showing up into this space, you know, what's coming up for you? Stress about the future, feeling always on guard, ready to go. I resonate with that. I'm always worried about fire, anxiously awaiting the rain, hoping for the winds to subside, feeling emotional, appreciative, and stuck, feeling of fragility, and October bringing fears, this feeling ready to evacuate. Yes, we are not alone in these feelings. I'm imagining that all of us in this community on this call are also experiencing these, these feelings. I want to just acknowledge that this format being in a webinar format prevents me from being able to feel like I'm in circle with all of you. So I'm really using my imagination right now and imagining us in circle. And I wanna acknowledge that because we have to do a lot of things online now there, we might feel a sense of separation or distance from one another. But as I'm reading the chats here, I'm, I'm recognizing that I'm in the company of my community. And I want to invite us to think of ourselves in a very large circle together. And also I wanna invite before we go any further, because we're not in person and I can't read the room or body language or what's going on for you, I wanna invite you to please think of someone and write down their name or just note it. Someone who you feel comfortable reaching out to, to talk to, should you find that emotions are stimulated through this experience and you wanna have a touchstone person to be able to connect with afterwards. Um, I'm also threading back, I'm reading a lot of gratitude, grateful for our community, grateful for the opportunity to connect, 
grateful for these resiliency tools that can help us manage our fear and anxiety. And I can attest to the fact that I have evacuated now four times. Um, and each time I've had a very different stress reaction to the evacuation. And I'm really curious how many of us, oops, pardon me, also are noticing how stress shows up in our body in this time. Uh, I noticed stress in my body, um, the most recent evacuation, almost as if I got punched in the gut. And even though I was doing some of my tools, I still felt that like feeling punched in the gut. And I'm curious, does any, would you guys be willing to talk about or share in the chat where you feel stress or how it shows up for you in these moments? Thank you to those who are contributing in the chat. I'm gonna read a couple. I stress about the wildlife burning to death because of fire and domestic animals corralled nowhere to run and fire and fear. And when I read those words, I feel that in my body. And thank you to Ingrid for noting she feels it in her shoulders. Difficulty sleeping, I'm reading, stomach, heart racing, yes, feelings of anxiety, especially with sleep. It's hard to go to sleep after um, we've been through what we've been through. Every time I hear an emergency alert, my heart drops, yes. We're all in each other's company. Some of us are even experiencing nightmares, having heightened anxiety, even with the sunset. I know when my neighbors have a barbecue, it sets off my stress response. Um, someone noted that it's hard to leave. Um, I feel a little bit of panic myself uh, whenever I have to leave the house and leave the animals. Um, thank you for noting the fidgeting in the mind, constantly racing and feeling it in the chest. Everything that you all have shared are all stress responses. Um, these are things that happen autonomic, on it, they, they tap into our autonomic nervous system. So it's as if we don't have control with the reactivity. But I want to introduce this connection to breath because our breath is our key to being able to control when we start to have that heightened stress reaction. So right now, I want to invite you just to feel the support of the earth under your feet, the ground beneath you. And the earth beneath us all. Take a moment to imagine yourself deeply rooted and connected. If you feel comfortable, you can lower or soften your gaze or even closing your eyes. And notice your breath, the air as it passes in through your nose, traveling through your, your diaphragm, filling your belly like a soft balloon. And notice the air traveling back up and out and just notice. Bringing your awareness to your breath. And now a little more intentionally, breathe in slow and deeply into your belly so that it rises and think to yourself soft. And as you exhale, exhale thoroughly so that your belly button engages the back of your belly. Thinking belly. So we're inhaling soft, exhaling belly. I like to do this three times at least, nice and slow. And if that doesn't help to 
to get me back into a place where I can feel more capable of moving forward, then I just kind of stay in there and do it a little bit longer. I think what is so particularly unique about this community that we're gathering tonight is that we are all aware of our deep connection to this place, to the web of life. And I want to invite in this poem, Chief Seattle, who is Duwamish. He says, humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. And so I wanna invite in this idea that what we do for ourselves, how we care for ourselves also impacts that web of life. And for those of us who are actively stewarding and caring for this planet and its people and its species, it might be more challenging for us as we navigate heightened levels of urgency and anxiety and fear and depression. And these are all truths of our experience. We're all connected with all of life. And I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing with us in the chat, what do you feel connected to most right now? The land, nature, what are you feeling connected with? The changing seasons, each other, beloved people, caring for the land, the smell of the earth in autumn my mom and reading and imagining being in nature, water, compassion, connecting to presence itself. Thank you for sharing these, the birds and picking pomegranates and persimmons in my family. And this is why we do the work that we do because we love and we're connected with all of life. This also can be like a double-edged sword if we're not taking care of ourselves. We can experience compassion fatigue and burnout. The land is the heart of the community. Acknowledging that this relationship that we have with the land is reciprocal. We give, we take, it gives, it takes. It's more of a dance, less than um, something tangible that's, that's given. It's more of relationship with land, relationship with water. These are the things that connect us, our relationships. And as stewards of our home, this earth, I wanna invite in this idea that when we take the time for self-care and to heal, that healing begins from within us and it ripples outwards, not just to our family, our community, our colleagues, but it resonates on the planet as well. And our responsibilities that we have to this web of life very much include caring for our own health and well being. And oftentimes we know that, but it's really hard to do in practice. And as we tend to ourselves, we're really stimulating our own Im immune response. And as we become stronger, more resilient, healthier, 
we are then stimulating a greater immune response on the planet. As, uh, as my colleague Griselda lifted up resilience and what is resilience, I like to think of it as a process and a practice. So it is definitely a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedies, threats. These things that we've been living through are indeed significant sources of stress. Resilience is also a practice. It's a practice of these behaviors, thoughts, actions that are focused on connection and our wellness and healthy thinking and meaning making that really anyone can do. And in this way, self-care is indeed an act of resilience, something we can practice and get better at. When we do this practice of resilience, it has profound potential for our own personal and our collective growth and the change in healing that we're all seeking on the planet at this time. So we like to leverage resources. And oftentimes I think we underestimate the fact that we are embodied beings. We have bodies. Right now we're heads on a screen in boxes, but in truth, we're these dynamic bodies that need movement. And when we have heightened stress reactions, much like an animal, we need to move that energy out. We need to be able to metabolize the stress hormones and movement and shaking it off is a really great way to do that. And so I like these images, they're very fun. Just imagine yourself being able to shake. And even if you're having some sort of a physical limitation, there's probably some part of your body that you're still able to move or shake. And so inviting in movement, exercise, um, anything that enables you to, to tune into your body, what's going on in your body, is going to help you take care of yourselves. A very, very important resource that we often overlook and think that gets most impacted when we have stress is our capacity for rest and for deep restorative sleep. And so taking time to pause and rest is a very powerful act of self-care. And it's even more challenging when we feel that sense of urgency and that need to be doing um, and being a part of active solutions. It can be really hard to stop. I struggle with this one myself, being able to slow down and take time out. Um, but it really is in that sleep and the sleep REM cycles that our nervous systems are able to better restore. So now what I'd like to invite in is a guided imagery activity that we're going to do. Um, I invite you, we're gonna take about 10 minutes for this process. So if you're, if you're sitting or standing or you're in a position that um, is not as comfortable as you'd like it to be, I invite you to please get comfortable you can lay down, you can sit still. Um, you'll want to be able to have your body in a way where your uh, feet can connect with the ground. It's very helpful. We're going to use the inner wisdom guided imagery tool. And I wanna give a little context to this. Guided imagery is something that has been used for time immemorial across cultures, across continents. This is a foundational practice of most indigenous peoples 
um, around the world. They do these mind-body medicine practices. We've all of the um, practices that we teach through mind-body medicine are evidence-based, but I also want to acknowledge that there are, and these are deep indigenous practices as well. The purpose of doing this activity is to help us to access some subconscious information and guidance that we might not have access to in our normal states of consciousness, and to help us really foster a sense of our own inner wisdom. Um, at this time, I think one of the things that we struggle with um, is that feeling of, of being alone and that we don't know what to do. And I want to, this activity I think will help us tap into the, our inner wisdom and guidance. I do want to name sometimes when we do guided imagery, we can have strong emotional memories be evoked. We also might um, feel uncomfortable or feel stretched to a personal edge. And I want to encourage you to please do what you need to do to take care of yourself and keep yourself comfortable during this process. And so I invite you to please sit comfortably, take a, a few slow, deep breaths. And as you breathe gently, deeply, notice your body begin to soften. You may notice your shoulders relaxing, your belly softening. You may notice that your vision is softening and if it is right for you to do so, please close your eyes. We trust that our imaginations will guide us and do the work for us. As your attention is focused on your breathing, notice your body feeling more comfortable. Breathing is rhythmic, calming. I invite you to imagine yourself in a very special place. It could be a real place, a place you may have actually visited or a place you'd like to visit. Perhaps a beautiful spot in nature or a comforting place in your own home. You may know the place well or have never seen it before. It may be an imaginary place. a place in fairy tales, indoor or outdoor, it doesn't matter. And should more than one place come to mind, allow yourself to stay with just one. What matters is that this is a place in which you feel completely comfortable. You feel comfortable and secure. Begin to notice the scene with all of your senses. The sounds, the smells, even notice the feeling of air on your skin. Allow your imagination 
to touch and feel the whole environment you are in. Now bring your awareness to yourself in this environment. Notice what you're wearing. The time of year, time of day, the season. Bring your awareness to the temperature of the air on your skin. Does it feel warm or cool? Observe how old you are in this space. And notice if you're alone or are is there someone else or something else there with you? Perhaps a person or an animal or an ancestor. Notice if something's missing or someone's missing and if you want to invite that into the space to make it more comfortable, do so. And as you breathe, feeling yourself in this very special place. You notice something in the distance. A wise and helpful being is moving slowly towards you, coming to offer support and guidance. There is nothing threatening about this experience and you are feeling very comfortable and at ease. Begin to picture this wise being who will greet you. Just accepting what comes. It may be a man, a woman, a child, an animal, something of nature, or perhaps just a presence or a feeling. But notice it, take it in. How is it presenting itself to you? Noticing especially how its energy feels to you. If you feel comfortable and at ease and warm, you can be sure this is an inner guide, part of your wiser self. Leaning into this presence with this being, greet it, acknowledge its presence, in whatever way feels right. This wise being is here to help you, to guide you. This wise being has a message for you. You may even have a question. Listen to the message. I'm going to be quiet for a couple of minutes so you can spend some quality time with your wise being.
In a moment, I'm going to begin to ask you to come back. But before I do, your wise being may have a gift for you. If so, accept this gift as offered. And now I invite you to give thanks, knowing that you can return it anytime you wish, just by doing what we're doing now, sitting or lying down in a comfortable place, allowing your eyes to come closed and going to your special place and imagining your wise being coming to greet you, to support you. But for now, at a pace that's comfortable. Bring your awareness back into the room, noting the sounds, the feeling of the air on your skin, the support of the chair beneath you and the earth beneath us all. Breathing gently, very gradually open your eyes. And you may wanna stretch, or move your body. You might wanna write down any messages or insights that came from your wise inner self. And if you feel so called, I invite you to share the wisdom that you learned from this experience or parts of it in the chat so that we all can, can be part of this collective body of wisdom and learn from each other. And we'll spend some more time in the Q&A afterwards um, where we can share and connect and discuss this experience. For now, I'd just like to leave us with a note on gratitude. That gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance, chaos to order, confusion to clarity. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, and a stranger into a friend. And it is with gratitude that I am here with you tonight. Thank you. And I pass it back to my new friend, Mireya. Thank you, Nicole. That was beautiful. <laughs> Definitely feel very refreshed from that. And thank you to Joe and to Grisela as well for presenting tonight with us. And thanks to all of you for attending tonight and joining us in this journey. We'll get to Q&A in just a moment. And for those of you that want to stick around, um, It'll be just one bit before we start on the Q&A. Before any of you leave, um, I'd like to share with you all that um, you can keep engaged with the Land Trust by following our various uh, social media accounts or visiting our website. Attendees can view past presentations and download educational materials on our Nature at Home page on our website, SonomaLandTrust.org. 
nature hyphen at hyphen home. And you can keep an eye out for our monthly language of the land webinars um, at our sonomalandtrust.org outings page. And just a reminder that thank you for joining us. We have plenty of these presentations coming up as well as bilingual programs that are in person for families. I'll drop the link in the chat in just a bit. Familias al aire libre will be starting soon. Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. That includes programs like this one, program, programs like our Familia Al Aire Libre, our Conservation Council, and so many more, including the work that we do to help conserve land here in Sonoma County. If you like what you heard today, please consider donating. Your gift helps support land protection and preservation. Make a donation online to Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. Thank you so much. In these uncertain times, we appreciate everyone who is supporting our work, even just sharing what we're doing and sharing about these presentations does so much. So now we'll get started with our Q&A. You can drop any questions that you may have using the Q&A button below. And um, we'll, um, you can add any questions at any time during this Q&A session. You can also check out with the Q&A button any questions that may have already been answered. So there is one question that I see here about uh, wilderness first responder training. Um, and I just want to note that you can go to the NOLA website or um, there's also one for SF, um, Get Ready SF, I believe, uh, where you can sign up for classes for wilderness first aid or wilderness first responder. So do you have something to add on that? We can't hear you, Joe. Hello now. Sam, just that I did it a few years back and highly recommend if you're interested. Absolutely. And I see that there was um, a few questions that were already answered. Um, so there was a question asked of jo for Joe, what is the risk of actually starting a fire and doing the controlled burn has this ever happened before? Joe, would you like to explain a little bit more in detail? Uh, yeah, just that it's sort of how what I was talking about earlier is that we can wait for the fire to come to us under the conditions that we've seen, you know, high winds, high heat, the middle of fall, with summer and fall, or we can sort of proactively start under controlled conditions and, um, and steer and manage and, and seize back that power, so to speak. Um, and so there is always a risk, you know, there's a risk if for you, you know, crossing the road at a busy intersection, but we manage that risk by looking both ways and um, not to say that it's exactly the same level, but, but that, that the, we work with the CAL FIRE and trained professionals to make sure that the weather's right, the fuel is right, the wind is not gonna misbehave and, um, you know, everything goes smoothly. Um, there have been uh, escaped prescribed fires in the past that have damaged houses and such, but um, uh, we're you know doing everything with everything we can to prevent that. We've seen much more damage from wildfire, so it's it's a tool in the toolbox to get ahead of the wildfire problem um, and sort of put uh, yeah do what we can when we want to. Yeah, definitely. And getting our mind and bodies prepared is also very important as we go through very um, traumatic events and 
experience a lot of stress. So we do have uh, someone in the audience asking um, about more information about trainings with um, the resilience group and where exactly can they get more information? Nicole? Yes. Um, if you were to go to socoresilience.org, you could learn more about um, the active programs. There are resources in both English and Spanish, like there are actually um, recordings of different types of these resilience tools that people can listen to online. Like for example, the guided meditations. Um, and then there are also support groups. So the Resilience Collaboratives trainers, we've had 200 people in our community trained in mind-body medicine practices with the intention that they would pay these practices forward and teach them either in workshops or in an eight week um, series in a small group series. And if, and I was reading through some of the chats that some people's um, inner guide was saying they needed this, this weekly. Well, an eight week session might be just the thing that would benefit you um, because you get to be in a small group and community and practice these skills together and talk about um, what it means for you. And also I wanna lift up that the Resilience Collaborative has been doing trainings with other organizations throughout the county and beyond actually, to be able to embed these practices within local organizations. So for example, Daily Acts where I work, we had all of our staff go through an eight week mind body medicine training so that we knew that our staff had greater capacity to manage the stressors that we deal with you know, working in climate change um, can be quite challenging. So that was a practice that was supportive for us. And that's something that could support other people in schools as well through the Resilience Collaborative. Thank you for that, Nicole. I'm wondering too, um, like as a, per like <laughs> a question from me is, um, how, what kind of training is available for those that may not have um, time during the day to be able to um, get training? Is it in the evening? Are there evening options? There are. Um, you know, if you were interested, like if you had a, a family or community that wanted to have a training, so for example, I live in, in Forestville and some of that emergency preparedness work that Griselda had mentioned, like, do you have a plan? Do you know what your neighbor's plans are? Do you know who needs help and support? We're building that type of community resilience um, in our, amongst our neighborhood. And then we're practicing these things. So that could be a place that this could be practiced. And once you connect with the Resilience Collaborative, there are you know, a couple hundred different people who have been trained who may be able to meet with you in the capacity that works for you. It doesn't always have to happen during, a, during the day. There are a lot of evening and weekend classes as well. Thank you, Nicole. Oh, you're welcome. Thank I wanna lift up something in the chat. Oh, actually let's let Griselda answer because Griselda can speak far more articulately to what the Resilience Collaborative is up to these days. Thank you, Nicole. I am, yes, um, definitely go to SoCo Resilience. That is where we are having um, most of our calendars uh, of groups and, and workshops that are happening. But we are being more intentional because we do understand that folks are zoomed out. So whenever there is someone that wants a um, workshop or a group, um, we do uh, reach out to our pool of trained facilitators and then plug them into those organizations directly. Um, currently, we are running a pilot where if someone has a desire to bring um, and or uh, look at the, the how to embed mind-body techniques, um, we are uh, putting trained facilitators to work with you alongside. Um, our only ask is that the employees and or clients um, get some sort of compensation um, 
in order to be able to really embed this into the organizations. And then on the resilience collaborative side, we are uh, providing a stipend for our training facilitators if they are plugged into an organization. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I do see a question that came up in the chat. Can anyone who has affected by who was affected by the fire feel traumatized, but did not lose any physical things? Actually, empathize with someone, empathize with someone who lost everything. Mm -hmm. I want to thank this person for speaking to this. I think that this is an important thing for us to address. And first of all, I want to acknowledge that what our community went through in losing the, those who were directly affected, those who had primary traumas, that means that they survived something tremendous, horrible, um, extraordinary loss and, and the pain and grief that comes with that um, cannot be measured. Right? So it's very hard for us to say, can we actually empathize with someone? No, I, I can't completely understand what that is unless I experience that myself. However, I want to differentiate something and acknowledge this. There are different levels of trauma. So there's primary trauma, like something that directly happens to us. For example, someone who lost a home or a loved one to the fire. There are also secondary traumas. That means we witnessed someone we love experience a trauma. That can be quite traumatic as well. Secondary traumas also exist in our community for those of us who are holding space for people who have experienced trauma. So oftentimes educators, therapists, counselors, the people who work at the permits department, like people who we wouldn't, might not consider being on the front lines of helping support people, but are. And they're witnessing the stories because that's how we heal, is by telling our story, by being seen and witnessed for what we've suffered and experienced and being in community together and have that acknowledgement so there might be different levels of, of trauma, right? That primary or secondary, but please understand we have all been impacted by trauma and those traumas have been compounded traumas. So it's not as if we had this one-off event and we're trying to recover. We've had event compounded by event, compounded by event, throw in a global pandemic in the midst of another evacuation. And we have a compounded traumatic situation that requires, I think, a different level of understanding and sensitivity for our community members. I cannot empathize for what it is to have experienced everything. However, I have sat in circle with my students and my friends and my colleagues who have and I feel that pain with them because we're in this community together. Um, so I wanna thanks, thank that person for lifting that up. Also, I think what's very common is we say to ourselves, I didn't lose anything. So therefore I'm not as affected as somebody else and maybe I don't need help or support. And again, I wanna bring our awareness back to just when we witness people we, you know, we have that capacity for um, um, compassion fatigue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. And just like here in California, there are other places that are also affected substantially by wildfire. This question is for Joe. Australia is working with homeowners to allow them to stay and fight instead of fleeing fire. Any move to try that in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, so not to my knowledge that uh, Australia does quite a few things differently than we do. Um, there's the way that their land and housing and, and all of those things have developed over the years. Um, 
basically in California, it's a misdemeanor to not obey an evacuation order. So it would require a change to state law um, to, so technically, even if you do stay behind, um, they're very, very rarely would you get charged or arrested with that. Um, you know, people have stayed behind, but it's not encouraged and it is uh, um, against the law. Uh, so my whole, and I guess my advice there would be to, um, you know, do the work that the collaborator is trying to do and that, you know, everyone, all of our neighbors and community members should be doing ahead of time so that your property is in a safe place, a defensible place uh, before you evacuate and not think that just because you're there with, um, you know, the, some hoses and, and pumps and things, it's, it's gonna be a safe situation when the fire does come. Um, you know, we talk and work with uh, firefighters who've been doing this for 20 years and the last couple of years is things they've never seen before. You know, every year is something that's you know, bigger and crazier. and um, so it's it's really not uh, anything that that we could recommend or even think would is going to be changing down the road. That's super important to know. And we also have someone that um, was asking about uh, meditations that are offered throughout the week. Uh, Nicole Gisela, are you able to speak to those? Hey, Chris, are you still on? I am, sorry, I have a little one running around, so I'm like, <laughs> can you repeat the question again, Mireya? Yeah, there's someone that's asking about meditations that are offered Monday through Friday. Um, are you able to share a little bit more about that? Um, they're available with Dana Valley? Yes, yeah, so they are, um, if you go to socoresilience.org and under our events calendar, um, you will notice that there is daily meditations Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. at Pacific time. So anybody's welcome to join those. Dana Valley from West County Health is um, our lead facilitator helping to coordinate those. And she also has other facilitators that join on a daily basis. So anyone's welcome to join. It's, it's awesome to have it in your calendar as a way to step away from whatever meeting, um, you know, meeting to meeting as we do on a regular basis. So if you have it in your calendar, it's a friendly reminder of take your 10 minute break. Um, sometimes they do forgive, forgiveness meditations, walking meditations, um, guided imagery, um, as well as other modalities. Sounds like an awesome resource. Thank you so much for sharing about it. And I wanna thank all of you too for submitting your questions in the Q&A. Um, you can also reach out to us at any point if you have any questions. Um, whether they're in Spanish or English, we're here to help you out with them. And uh, Nicole and Gisela have dropped their emails in the chat and I'll make sure to include mine if you have any questions in Spanish for Joe or for Sonoma Land Trust. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you again, Nicole, Lisa, and Joe. It's been a wonderful evening, definitely relaxing. Um, even though we're talking about um, a time where it can be very traumatic to think about fires and or wildfires and hearing about the work and knowing about the work that the Sonoma Valley Wildland Collaborative is doing as well as the Sonoma County Resilience Group is doing. Um, is There's a lot that's going on in our community to keep us resilient. And until next time, please stay safe everyone and remember the new skills that you learned tonight Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Buenas noches. Good night. Gracias a Mariana. Muchísimas gracias a Mariana for translating. Couldn't have done this presentation without you. Thank you.